So my presentation today is really in three parts. What I'm going to do is briefly introduce what we did, what the nature of the audit was that we did. And then I'll talk about the overarching findings. What is the quality of housing across the country? And then after the break, a little bit later, I'll talk about some of the why factors, some of the reasons why we might be seeing the picture that we're seeing. But let's start off by uh, talking a little bit about how we did the audit. So we've heard about the drive uh, for more homes across the country. And with that has come a very loud call that those developments should be of a high standard of design in order to de deliver better quality places, more livable places, more sustainable places for residents. Now, Place Alliance research has shown that high quality design makes a huge difference in terms of making places more acceptable for communities, so they want more housing in their areas, but also that it adds value. It adds value economically, it adds value socially, it adds value environmentally, in terms of our health outcomes and so forth. Good design is fundamentally good for us as human beings. Housing design audits, as we've already heard, are a tool that were developed and used by CABE in the mid-2000s. Uh, they're essentially a systematic process to evaluate the design quality of the external residential environment. They're not about looking at the interior of homes, uh, they're not allowed about looking at the construction of homes. They're about evaluating that external residential environment. And CABE, as we've heard, conducted a series of these uh, in the mid-2000s. These three on the screen focused on particular regions of the country. And over a period of three or so years, three or four years, each region of the country was covered by that work. Today we've launched a new audit which is even bigger and even better than the original audits, um, if that was possible. Um, and the audit covers 142 large-scale housing development projects across England, it just focuses on England, and it measures those projects against 17 design criteria. Our aims were various, they included that we wanted it to be national. We wanted national coverage in the audits this time, so that, that was a sort of first. We wanted to be able to make regional comparisons back to the old regional audits that, that CABE did, so we could see where we'd gone in that intervening time. We wanted to create a new baseline so that we can see that we, we can understand where we are now and we can use this for a baseline going forward can measure uh, uh, against this in the future. We also wanted to ask some why questions to try and correlate any design findings with some of the other factors that impact on why design takes the form it does. And my final part of the presentation will focus on that a little bit later on this afternoon. We didn't want to name and shame. It's not about picking out particular developments particular developers, particular local authorities, and saying, isn't this dreadful? Aren't they doing a rubbish job? Uh, it's also, it's not about showcasing, you know, the, 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 the projects that we always see, the great exemplars. It's about understanding what is the common picture across the land. The work was conducted by a research team at the Bartlett School of Planning at UCL. And uh, many, many thanks to Amma and Valentina and Fola and Anastasia and to our honorary research member, Paul, uh, who helped us really throughout out the project, uh, who you've already heard from. The work was conducted as a partnership between uh, the CPRE uh, and uh, the Place Alliance and funded between those two uh, organisations. But we had a diverse alliance of organisations that worked with us throughout the project because we wanted it to be seen as a rigorous study um, that wasn't just advancing the case of the CPRE or UCL or Place Alliance, but actually was uh, a proper, robust and rigorous study. And so to hold our feet to the fire, we had 
uh, the Home Builders Federation, we had Civic Voice, we had the Academy of Urbanism, Design Council, Urban Design Group, the UK Build, uh, Green Building Council, and the Institute of Highways and Transportation, who were with us throughout the process and checking uh, the process that we were uh, using. The work was also underpinned by professional input from Arabs, from JTP, from Sporforth and Urbed, uh, and a network of specially trained volunteers from across the country, professional volunteers, um, who, without whom we couldn't have done the audit. They gave up their time. Uh, they went out in rain and wind uh, and did the audit for us, and thank you very much to them. So our approach, how did we conduct the audit? Well, we took the 10 largest regional builders in each region. So we weren't just looking at the 10 largest nationally, we were looking at each region, who were the 10 largest players, and that was our starting point. We looked at their websites to identify the projects that they had been building, and we looked at local authority uh, planning portals as well, to look at the different projects that had been built by these builders within the different regions of the country. We chose projects that, had, that ranged in scale from at least 60 dwellings up to about 3,000 dwellings. So these are large projects that we were focusing on with large house builders. And broadly mid-market, we chopped off those in the very highest part of the market, the top 10%, and those at the very lowest part of the market. So broadly, we were looking at the mid-market product. We tried to choose a range of different contexts. Uh, many of them are in what you might call suburban areas, but also more inner urban areas uh, as well, and rural schemes uh, too. But we, we avoided schemes that were in the middle of our cities, in the middle of London, for example, because those markets are quite different. It's a different type of product. And we avoided schemes such as office to residential, and there's some quite large projects, but we, we didn't want those included in this particular piece of research. We gathered our auditors together, we trained them in uh, a number of uh, events uh, in London and elsewhere around the country, and we told them that the first thing they need to do is they needed to forget their own tastes, their own opinions, their own preferences, their own prejudices. And we all have them, of course. We all know what we like and we like what we know. Um, and also their practices, because they're all involved in practice in various ways. Also the weather. Um, which obviously, if it's raining and horrible when you visit somewhere, it never looks as good as if the sun is out. We gave them, and we developed a, a pro forma, an audit pro forma, that allowed them to make systematic, rigorous assessments. And essentially, using the same or very similar criteria to the original CABE audits. The methodology essentially built on those original CABE audits so that, the, so that it was comparable, the new audit was comparable. Four major topic areas, environment and community, place character, streets, parking, pedestrian experience, and detailed design and management, and 17 key design considerations, focusing on the external built environment, with a number of sub-criteria to help auditors to understand each of these 17 headlines and to be able to interpret it in each local circumstance. And then we asked them if they could to gather some opinions from the residents living in the, each of the projects that they uh, evaluated. Ultimately, every audit that we gathered together, all 142 of them, are based on those professional judgments that those volunteers made out in the field using the system that we had put together. But we asked it, them to back that up with evidence, photographic evidence. So whenever they scored at one of those 17, we asked them to photograph that. You know, what is the evidence for that assessment? And then our advisory group got together and looked at a cross-section of all the audits. They looked at about 10% of the audits in one day here uh, at UCL to ensure that there was some rigor, uh, rigor and consistency across the auditors and 
that broadly they were happy with the audit that we were presenting to them. That they felt that it was uh, consistent and rigorous in that sense. And they signed that off. We then crunched the data, a lot of data to crunch, and Amma did a fantastic job uh, in, in crunching much of that data. We correlated our design findings with some of these Y factors, factors around the market, how the market influences design outcomes, factors, some of contextual factors, different types of urbanity, density, and so forth. Uh, we cross-correlated it with types of design governance tools that are being used locally around the country to understand what impact they had. And uh, we also, as I said, looked at those resident views and we, we related those to a recent study we'd done of community views. We also did 18 more, slightly more in-depth case studies to see if we could understand the process in a number of these cases. Then we wrote the report, we were about to launch it when Boris Johnson got in the way and called an election, that was back in December, uh, and now here we are, a month or so later, finally launching the report, uh, and it's a great relief to be here today to present it to you. What I'm going to do now is go on to present the first part of the findings, the what. What are we delivering collectively in this country as regards design quality? What are we seeing out there? And as I say, I'll come back to the why factors uh, a little bit later on. So, the headline, or headlines. Now, usually I have to make up my own headlines, but today we actually had some proper headlines. Um, on the BBC and in newspapers and all over the place, which was, which was uh, great to see. And some of those reporters took a few liberties with our reports, you'd expect that. But I suppose the overwhelming headline, the thing which really came through, was that 75% of our new housing in England is either mediocre or poor in its design quality. Now let's compare our findings and that particular finding to national policy. The NPPF clearly states that permission should be refused for development of poor design. This statement is nothing new. Yet the design of 20% of our sample was so poor that you might argue it should never have been given planning permission in the first place. The MPPF also says that good design is a key aspect of sustainable development and helps make development acceptable to communities. Arguably, a further 54% is not good design because we found it to be mediocre and is therefore not sustainable and should not have been granted planning permission, at least not in the current form. It could have been better. It could have been better, the expectation perhaps should have been that it was better. About a quarter of our new housing estates are meeting the standard of good design, good or very good design. The best and the worst is spread widely when we look nationally uh, around the country, widely distributed, but some regions are clearly performing better than others. We can broadly put them into three categories. Those which are performing well, uh, Greater London, the West Midlands, and the South East, we can broadly put into that category. Those which are performing far less well would be the South West and the East Midlands, noticeably poorer developed. And then the rest, which we could say are solidly mediocre. Uh, some good, some bad, but balanced around a strong core of mediocre design. And when we look at the English national average, then that's pretty solidly mediocre as well. If we scored absolutely every criteria three, then we would have got a score of three. And in fact, we came out at 3.12. So the average development is pretty mediocre not that great. However, 
When we compared it back to the cave audits, and I remind you we used essentially the same methodology, then we saw that in fact there had been an uplift, an uplift of 7.7% since 2007. And all regions had improved except for the southwest and the northwest. The West Midlands, the South East and Greater London had improved the most and by far the most. So should we celebrate? Well, when we look at design policy and, and the national emphasis on design, then it goes up and down and sometimes it's governments are interested in these things and sometimes they're not. When, this la when the last audits occurred, the conclusion of CABE at that time was the audit paints an uncompromising and unflattering picture of the quality of new housing built over the past five years. There's far too much development that is not up to standard and far too little that is, exe that is exemplary in design terms. Our report today concludes that we've seen a minimal and patchy improvement over this 15 years or so, which whilst welcome of course it's welcome. Given the very low base from which these results build, such a minimal improvement is, I think, disappointing. If we strip out the three best performing regions, London, the South East and the West Midlands, then there's been virtually no improvement nationally in the quality of design over the last 15 years. Let's dig down into what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong. And again, we can put these design considerations into three groups. Some which are often successful, some which are varied and often challenging for us, and some which are pervasively problematic. Starting with those that are successful. Now, two considerations scored notably better uh, best of all was safety and security, suggesting that the sort of secured di by design parameters of recent decades have been cutting through and have been successfully mainstreamed across many developments across the country. Schemes were also typically successful at integrating a variety of housing types as regards a mix of typologies, different sizes within sites, and uh, in order to also integrate different tenures in design terms. So it wasn't obvious necessarily, more, more often than not it wasn't obvious, which was the affordable housing, which was the market housing and so forth. So that again was successful. We didn't measure the percentage of affordable housing, that was beyond our remit. Onto the varied but challenging categories, um, these, uh, the, the, uh, a number of these, uh, notably street legibility, uh, connectivity and street definition, relate broadly to how schemes are laid out spatially. Notably, how streets are defined by houses, how they connect up together and with their surroundings, how easy it is to navigate the street environment. Practice in this area was very diverse on all these fronts, with many schemes designed as, or perhaps too many schemes designed as rather insular development, uh, defined by roads rather than by spatially defined and navigable streets. The next three issues, uh, pedestrian cycle friendly, public transport and the availability of local facilities determine to a large degree the extent to which inhabitants are likely or not to rely on their private cars. All these elements have a significant impact on the walkability of developments with likely strong health and social impacts on residents. Again, many developments were failing in this regard with streets that uh, can often be hostile to pedestrians and which encourage the use of cars for even routine daily tasks like going to get a pint of milk. So again, varied but too often challenging. 
The architectural quality uh, and the existing and new landscape quality of schemes also fell into this varied and challenging category. Here there was a wide variation in practice, which was evident across the country, both with regard to the detail and integrity of architectural solutions and the balance of green elements, including street trees, with hard landscape elements and its detailed realisation and lack of biodiversity. In terms of environmental impact, uh, we measured this through EPC uh, energy rating. So this was the only design consideration which, if you like, related to the house rather than the wider uh, environment. And this sat at the top of this category of varied and challenging with most schemes achieving the minimum required by building regulations, but relatively few seeking really to go at all beyond that absolute minimum requirement, and a worrying minority falling below even that minimum statutory standard. Moving on to the most problematic categories of design considerations. The dominance of storage in bins, overly engineered highways infrastructure and car parking were amongst the most perva uh, pervasively problematic concerns. The combined result were that new housing developments were dominated by large areas of hard, unattracted, unattractive surfaces, tarmac and paviors, parked cars and bins. The overwhelming sense in too many projects was that these are places for cars, perhaps even places for bins, rather than for humans. Um, and in fact, as you will see in almost all of our images, humans are pretty difficult to spot. Um, there was almost nobody in most of these schemes when we were there. Of course, we were. most of our audits happened during the week during the day and that might explain at least partially that finding. Finally, public open and play spaces were often poorly located and designed and fa failed too often to create a social focus for schemes. Housing units were frequently of a standard type with little obvious reference to the local context or little attempt to create something distinctive. Low scoring schemes performed especially poorly in the categories of architectural response and character of development. But uh, in reality, all the elements covered in this pervasively problematic uh, category undermined that quality and character of new environments, too many of which had little distinguishing personality or sense of place. Now, some of you may have read our excellent Place Alliance report on place value uh, and seen its ladder of uh, place quality. In this report, instead of a ladder, we have a stairway to quality. Uh, the good news being that we've already climbed the first two steps um, and we've only been building suburbs for 100 years or so. And the bad news is we've got 15 to go. Some design considerations, more often than not, we're getting right. Some are variable, and it depends on where we're building in the country and a whole set of other factors that I'll talk about later. Others, far more often than not, we're simply getting wrong. There are six key things that we get wrong most often. Car parking, the character of development, public open and play space, storage and bins, architectural response and highways design. Improvement is clearly required. Thank you.